the betrayal of the national democracy of industrial Ulster would mean a carnival of reaction, both north and south, would set back the wheels of progress, would destroy the oncoming unity of the Irish labour movement and paralyse all advanced movements while it lasted. Folks you first you hear are delighted to be working with Kistia, Arakta and RSE Conula as we seek to uncover the hidden heritage of James Connolly's time in Belfast. Connolly lived and worked in Belfast. James Connolly was a prolific writer and I'm coming from you today from Lower Lani Conula, the James Connolly Library which takes pride of place in the new James Connolly Visitor Centre. Writing in 1914 in The Irish Worker, a publication edited by Jim Larkin and James Connolly, Connolly foresaw the impact of partition. He said it would lead to a carnival of reaction. We would love to reflect on all of this in person, but of course in these Covid times we will bring this to you, these reflections, virtually. So instead we have produced a series of many documentaries that seek to explore all aspects of Connolly's time in Belfast. We hope you enjoy. I want to once again thank our partners and funders, Kistia Arakta, Falcha First You Here, and the entire team at RSE Conula. James Conley never lived to see the partition of Ireland or the carnival of reaction he said it would cause. As we approach 100 years of partition, RSE Conula are reflecting upon his words. And with the acceleration of the Irish unity debate, will Conley's dream of a socialist republic ever be realised? Uh, imposition of partition dates to the 23rd of December 1920 when the British government passed the Government of Ireland Act of Westminster. This is often sometimes referred to as the Partition Act or sometimes even the fourth Home Rule Bill because in effect that's what it was. It established, it provided initially for the establishment of two Home Rule Parliaments in Ireland, one in Northern Ireland and one in Southern Ireland. Now, the Southern Ireland one never came into effect, and under the terms of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December 1921, Southern Ireland became the Irish Free State. The 3rd of May is, uh, 1921 is generally recognised by historians as the day in which Northern Ireland officially came into existence, because that's when the provisions of the Government of Ireland Act came into effect, and the following day, writs were passed for the holding of elections for the parliaments of Northern and Southern Ireland. But partition is a reality, and I suppose the reality of Northern Ireland really dates to that day in June 1921 when the Northern Ireland Parliament came into being and was up and running and had jurisdiction over domestic affairs in Northern Ireland. It was not just Ireland was partitioned. The fact that we got the six county Northern Ireland meant that Ulster was partitioned. And this had, had noticeable effects within the province. For example, uh, traditional trading routes, very strong uh, economic links were established between towns like Monaghan and Armagh. And those links were certainly, they, they, were, they didn't disappear overnight, but they certainly were damaged by the imposition of border infrastructure and the uh, establishment of customs posts along the border, initially put there by the Free State Government, it should be noted. So it's important to bear in mind from a, a local perspective that not only was the island of Ireland partitioned, but the province of Ulster was partitioned as well. Ireland would be partitioned. There would be two parliaments, north and south. The question was, what would the area, the acreage of the new Northern Ireland be? Uh, they favoured the nine counties, which would give unionism a small majority with a large Catholic minority from down to Donegal. Think of Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan coming in. That would have destabilised the overwhelming Protestant majority that Craig wanted. And you've guessed it. Craig intervened very early on and made clear his views. We know we see his intervention in, of course, um, the 13th of November 1919. The committee were informed that Craig had given his view. And I just quote you what Craig said. Craig expressed himself against the inclusion of the whole of Ulster in the Northern Parliament and thought six counties preferable. 
So here you have the leader of nine-county Ulster unionism rejecting the nine counties and, of course, disappointing the hopes of the Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal Protestants, 82,000 of them. And this is what the minutes record from the Long Committee in 1919. The reason given was that, quote, and this is Craig's very words, Protestant representation would be strengthened and Craig also thought that six counties would be a unit easier to govern. In other words, this is the sectarian headcount behind partition. Too many nationalists, too many Catholics from the beginning would have destabilized the state, given the higher Catholic birth rate, which was always a worry for unionism at that time. Marshin, the real distuhish, cares to be on and show, a her boggarch, Darlesh Natoria, August Darlesh and Moniak, the Gasvian Tarm, August and Monarchak, the Gazahan Rods and Aurian, some Monarch Shaw, Hugshaw Duh and the Hemperacta. Dama Rode Guru Er Boniak Imperial Nabratine, a fine real to support the Nehereni, they you are going to egg Nadini Donna, because Nadini Gorama Fodfad the Hemperacta done in real to see, be in Chelu Shaw, a Chakan Chinens and Inja, August and Senega Tanakin, Marshinda. Khehi tu an gerkem real to stu hi shagas gerkem allu a higvail mar class chef to cynical a dosid boniacht imperial la stapakhar la dolkan kin tien la hak safratan agas la stapakhar la dolkan kin agas sirsha in sin imperat agas shane a mugan folk. We now had a Northern Ireland Parliament and it resorted to coercion. The Be Specials and the Special Powers Act and the sectarian murders increased. Elizabeth Corr writes about this time. She and her family lived on the Ormo Road, an up, uh, a middle class family. She and her sister Nell were in Kaminaman. One of her brothers was an IRA, IRA volunteer, but she'd had two brothers who fought in the Great War on the Allied side, one of whom had been killed in the Somme. So she had a family of, of different political allegiances, but they were very much a, a, a minority on the Ormo Road, a Catholic family in a very Protestant area. And she said that between riots, police and military raids, life was anything but pleasant. And she talked about one chilling time when one of the police who had raided her house in the past came to warn her that he had heard that there was going to be uh, they, a possible visit by the murder gang that night. He said for them not to go to bed, to keep an eye out, and if they heard anything, to phone him at the barracks and he would make sure somebody came. So Elizabeth said they stayed up all night, nothing happened, but when they looked at the Irish news the next day, they heard of the murder of the McMahon family, the killing of Owen McMahon, four of his sons and one of his barmen. And she said it was such a random thing that it could have been any Catholic family. It could have been them that night, but it wasn't. Mas my lad Lord for shakta has, agus for free grew has, agus for oregan and shaw and yearin, ni gadet ach brach new or in scale and shaw mil farsia, a der nijeg fiha, agus nijeg fiha da. Agus shahas rich or nodra, a viagiri ga shreeb, a scaru on a kila. The unwrat and the glue, I guess, they are not a stack and some skilled shaw. I guess, hook shade carte blanche from the hint of the shaw elegiani. I guess, you should one shield, statching in forty. Listen, the cook the slander is rainy in either the hurupa. Ligame shit up with a smack the kindle, er, and Vinlock is lochily in yarn, shin and minlock cash like up in snake hundy. So, if you have a blood rail for origin, you can see the liberal, 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 you can see I think Connolly was right about what he foresaw the impact of partition to be. I mean, he foresaw the unleashing of really conservative forces, north and south, 
And I think that's what did happen on the island of Ireland. Um, and we can see that, you know, in the uh, immediate aftermath of partition and then in the decades since. And I suppose what I think of is um, the power of the churches north and south. Um, and you can see it very clearly in the south of Ireland where, you know, the Catholic Church just became enmeshed with the state and the values of the Catholic Church became the state values and policies as well. Um, and you can see that in the lives of, you know, the tragic consequences really for women and children. I suppose who I think of, you know, who comes to mind for me is uh, Anne Lovett, who died in um, 1984. She was 15 years old. She died giving birth to her baby son, who also died. She died in a grotto. And that, you know, was, was a reflection of the times and the conservative attitudes uh, towards women's reproductive um, rights and all of that uh, at the time. And then, you know, it was uh, even later in uh, 2012, Savita Halanapavar died in the south of Ireland uh, as a result of being den denied uh, an abortion and she died from a septic miscarriage. So I suppose when I think of Connolly's words, I think of the lives of women and children, but also there's particular people who come to mind. So Connolly, of course, was embedded then in both the history of the working class struggles uh, and the reality of the working class struggles north and south before partition. And his carnival re of reaction speech then, or his statement at that time, uh, was, as I say, grounded in that experience and warning that partition, which was then being mooted as a possible basis for a future home rule type of settlement, which of course was postponed by the by the, by the war. That he when when it was first mooted, he saw that the idea of partitioning part of the island would divide the working class internally between Protestant and Catholic workers. It would divide the country and the nation as he saw it, um, north and south. It would divide religions. It would divide men and women. It would damage the the, the potential for. Um, um, as he saw it, a, 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 a revolution in the interests of the working class, a socialist revolution, it would disempower and prevent the, the, the then growing campaigns for the emancipation of women and votes for women, uh, which was growing in strength in, in, in mainly in, in Britain. Um, and he basically said that it would be used as a tactic of divide and rule by the British imperialist power. And that's exactly what happened. So in that sense, his prediction is, was extraordinarily accurate and rooted, as everything Connolly did and said, in his analysis of what was happening on the ground, on the streets, in, in the factories, in the workplaces, and in the seats of power, um, both in Britain and in Ireland. Connolly's prediction of a carnival of reaction in the event of the partition of Ireland has been proved right almost every day since he said it on both sides of the border. Englishman and socialist George Orwell described his country as a family with the wrong members in control. The same descriptor could be applied to Ireland for much of the past century. Partition has seen the wrong members of our families take control in each part of our island. This arose from the very conservative revolutionaries or political cultures produced in the early 20th century and their successful conscription of the working classes for their competing visions of what became a divided island. These visions were competing but also complementary. Our revolutionaries never rattled the shareholders in either jurisdiction, while at the same time they isolated and submerged the real revolutionaries. So there was no room for the radical independent orange men who stood with Larkin in 1907. Nor was there room for the remnants of the Irish Citizens Army after 1921. For every Pedro O'Donnell, there were 10 Ernest Blythe. There was no room for Countess Markovich 
or her sisters in the patriarchy authored by de Valera and McQuaid. Nor in the Ulster Unionist cabinet in the Stormont, which saw one solitary woman, Dara Parker, serve in 50 years of one party rule. So in the period leading up to partition, there was great fluidity. There was a growth in socialism, in trade unions in Ireland. There was a growth in radicalism, republicanism. There was a growth in feminism, suffragism. There are opportunities to uh, transform the state. And we see that in the democratic programme of the Forstall, for example. Those great espousals of egalitarian politics, which were meant to underpin a new separate political entity, a free political entity. What happens instead with partition is that some of the conservative forces that Connolly would have been acutely aware of, for example, during the lockout period, during the period of militant trade unionism in Dublin, are put in power. And those forces create a state which is very closely aligned with the Catholic Church, a theocratic state, one that Sean O'Casey, for example, is extraordinarily critical of in his 1920s plays. This is a state which, and we see this in O'Casey's plays, is deeply disenchanting for the working class. It is one in which censorship laws are introduced, in which books are censored, for decades and decades to come, right into the 1970s, we see the emergence of a state which is uh, anti-feminist, which is sexist, which prescribes women's place to be very much in the home, which re reduces the opportunities for women to work outside the home, to work in public and civil service. It is a state in which we see the emergence of a tepid trade unionism in the Labour Party from the 1930s with William Norton um, and with Brendan Corrish later on. We have conservative Labour leaders, people who aren't really up for the radicalism that we saw in Connolly and Larkin and are very much uh, post the 1920s, really sidelined from a lot of the main, mainstream of Irish political power. Um, they become part of the apparatus, but not necessarily the radical voice that working class people need in terms of creating real change, the kind of change that was envisaged by the 1916 pro proclamation. It's just so clear that the North and South needed each other. What happened after partition was progressive forces on both sides, on all sides of Ireland, you know, went into abeyance. So, you know, what could have been, I sometimes think of what could have been, the radical um, influence of uh, Northern Protestants, the effect that that would have had uh, in the South. And yet that all became crushed and that radical progressive force became a very conservative force in the North. And really there became a collision because of that, that um, carving up of that particular area of Ireland in a particular way to create a majority. So there became then a, a collision between Protestantism and Unionism in the most conservative way, in a way that did great disservice. So the legacy of partition actually is to create a very flawed super as uh, artificial um, flawed state uh, in the north a stateless which uh, has a lot of power to do its own thing and which increasingly kind of is on the edge of the british orbit the edge of um, br uh, british uh, parliamentary politics while still being of course central to britain's desire to keep certain controls in ireland to keep control of territory in ireland there's Scarlett and Tillon show the great child. A mask na doing worry her or an hour. Earn a tubish deep of vasa a wool and pubble and sucky or as sails a two skirt axe a kahar sha a kaharaha. Na and doe in her akayu fenu lak or as mion and pubble the intact. Kaji shin kegger hasty low and nask less and fratten. I've shoe. Glaxiad less girl of Ernie yet, 
Hushia chase or hain mar to a dealish nahern. Lesson Churin, Lesson Government of Ireland Act, Mina Nullig, Nijaga Sophia, Hanig Ahru Santasak, Ervion, Nanin Taktori and Aishan, Curry Bam, Ernest Conde, Mark Hedged and Vratten, Lorshead and Tamar Fad, Faduda Ulster, August Ulsterman, August Alahaj, a Johnny Nyer Arge, Ern Conde has culture, and Cowan, Duna Nal, August Monaghan. Agus, in grade and culture, a win and bond and tradition. Because special than Chang a Gaelic is an common low class Gael. Curry and Ights na la Fenian need. Gan Takiacht, Agus Cusser Wallig, or who own real the Shaktak and St. Tushkart. Fu ma organ to your na Tushmori Nishanak, Yulti Shed Kedge Waraku, Anyam Yaka Gaelic, a Curran na Pashti. Fi Sean Aberchaku, Fu er ma Sean Waharhien, ni we she had passed so long close la Anya Marshan. Marshan vi Kevling to Nuran, Miss Nikiti Blaine, Marial Ker Go Nasasni, Ern Cheershaw, Ogus Marial Ern Colinahus, A Honiglesh, Akla Crit Jelt, Kahime Ra, Ker Eri. She a wad Aaron Nibawasa. Michelle. Looking at the northeast of Ireland in the years 1910 to 1920, from a period in history, it was usual for Protestants and Catholics to interact with each other in all areas workplace, home, hospitals, shopping, entertainment, many sports and leisure activities. It was only at the end of the decade that they revealed the different attitudes that entered their society. All felt that trust, which had been so much a part of their childhoods, ended, and the idea of the other side began. Historian Dennis Kennedy stated that after partition, the attitude of most Protestants hardened towards their Catholic neighbours. As we know from subsequent years, the carnival of reaction predicted by James Connolly had begun, and sadly the reactants are not yet transformed into a cohesive product. In the North, what you see is a reactionary state-sponsored discrimination from private enterprise through to how policing is done, through to how housing is allocated, and radical Presbyterianism, which had been known from the times of Tone and the Cave Hill and where all of those inspirational ideas around the time of revolutionary, um, revolutionary thought in Europe completely disappears and is replaced with this reaction, this discrimination, and all of it is state-sponsored on both sides of the, of the border, and it becomes almost self-preserving. So partition works in the interests of those who want to oppress and are self-serving on both sides of the border. And make no mistakes about it, the free state governments in the South benefited from partition too because they were never challenged out of their places of where they discriminated and oppressed and lined their own pockets. And I think that what we're having now is something that completely disrupts what has happened for the past 100 years and has served so many vested interests and that's why you have so much resistance against the conversation. The partition has clearly been disastrous for the island of Ireland and north and south, uh, economically disastrous, politically disastrous and socially disastrous. Um, Obviously, in terms of human rights and equality, in particular, I think Connolly's focus on social justice and, in, in modern terms, economic and social rights. I think what we've seen in particular is, in the North, economic and social devastation. And I think partition has really been a disaster for the North of Ireland. And I think that's clear in, in many, many ways. But I suppose the focus at the moment is a focus on social and economic inequality in both parts of the island. And obviously we're thinking about the past, and we're thinking about the legacy of partition in the time ahead. And that part legacy is profoundly problematic, but we're also thinking about the future. And I suppose at the moment, we're looking back at the last 100 years, but we're thinking about the next 100 years as well. And 
the conversation about the future of this island has really gained incredible momentum, particularly as a result of Brexit, where the North has been dragged out of the European Union against its will. And we're thinking about the future. In a sense, we're thinking about partition coming to an end in the time ahead. And in that conversation about the future of Ireland, I think it's absolutely vital that when we're thinking back on the legacy of James Connolly, that economic and social rights, that social justice is at the heart of that conversation. Because when we talk about a new Ireland, if we're serious about a new Ireland, then we have to address the profound socioeconomic inequality that exists in the North and exists in the South. And one way to do that is to make absolutely sure when we're talking about Irish reunification over the course of the next decade, that we bring equality and rights and social justice activists to the heart of that conversation to make sure that social and economic rights, that social justice is front and center in the narrative about the new Ireland that people are working to create. In Dublin City in 1913, the boss was rich and the poor were slaves. The women working and the children hungry. Then on came Larkin like a mighty wave. The workmen cringed when the boss man thundered. Seventy hours was his weekly chore. He asked for little and less was granted. Less getting little, he would ask for more. So in a sense, as we think about James Connolly, and we think about the disaster of partition for the island of Ireland in social and economic terms, we have to make absolutely sure that the next 100 years are different. And the way to do that, I think, is to make sure that economic and social rights are at the heart of the discussion about the new constitutional future that people are working to build on the island of Ireland for the next 100 years and beyond. So partition speaks of division, it speaks of being fractured, it speaks of being wounded. And I guess as um, a Christian woman and a woman of faith, um, I always like to look at these things through the lens of what it means to be a neighbour. Who is my neighbour? Um, and I've been doing a lot of work around that recently and trying to figure that out. What does it mean for us to be a nation of neighbours? And for those of you who are not familiar with the story, it's a simple story about a guy who was walking down a road. He got ambushed, beaten up, robbed, and left on the side of the road to die. And what we read off is two religious men who came uh, to the road, saw the wounded man, and decided to cross the road. And so the reason why I say this is because the future of partition and our thinking and our conversations is what we will hand on to our children and to our children's children. So for me, I guess when I look at the whole idea of what does it mean to be a neighbour and who is my neighbour, maybe we need for now to not cross the street anymore and take part in the conversations. So I think in the past three, four years, we've really seen the potential for and a desire for a new type of Ireland, one that is rights-based, one that is economically prosperous, one that is fair in its prosperity, but also one that looks at identity and cultural rights in a whole new way, one that's embracing rather than exclusive. You know, the promise of this conversation and the promise of what post-partition our island could look like is immense. And I actually think it's not going to look one bit like what our current two partitioned states look like. The last thing we want to do is replicate what has gone before. We want to create something new and that's the most exciting thing. I mean for me personally, um, I grew up in the market area which is directly affected by partition. The area was re redeveloped for security purpose by the British Army. Um, and that's had, a, that's had a number of impacts, it's had a number of social impacts, economic impacts. Um, as well as cultural. What I'm hoping is that we can end partition and start looking at the issues that really matter, the likes of rights, social justice, um, and start pushing for a future for ourselves. And again, you know, if we get a United Ireland tomorrow, that isn't going to change anything. We don't 
you, you can't just change the flag. And I think Connolly said it 100 years ago. He says that um, you can remove the English army, um, you can put a green flag upon Dublin Castle, but until you, until you set about the setting up of a 32 county socialist republic, your efforts will be in vain because England will rule you for capitalists, our landlords, and our financiers. So I think that's the key is that we need to get the United Ireland, but then we need to push on. In 1914, James Connolly published a piece called Labour and the Proposed Partition of Ireland, wherein he stated in part, the betrayal of the national democracy of industrial Ulster would mean a carnival reaction both north and south, would set back the wheels of progress, would destroy the oncoming unity of the Irish labour movement and paralyze all advanced movements. Of course, Connolly was right. With the exception of the limits he placed upon the carnival reaction, in 1914, he was referring to the north and south of Ireland. However, the ripple of that reaction reached the shores of the United States as well. And for the last hundred plus years, the north, the south of not only Ireland, but all points of America, and now since Brexit, Europe as well, has seen the great wisdom of James Connolly. He also noted it is the trusted leaders of Ireland that in secret conclave with the enemies of Ireland have agreed to see Ireland as a nation disrupted politically and her children divided under separate political governments with warring interests. However, there are many more eyes on Ireland today than ever before, and a secret conclave is no longer a secret. Connolly stood on one principle, that we were all created to be equal. Regardless of sex, race, religion, or most importantly, class, to Connolly, we were all sisters and brothers. That is why he fought so hard to preserve the rights of working men and women to work with dignity and respect. Together, we will reunite, re reunite not only Ireland, but the human race as well through organization and egalitarian recognition demonstrated in the labor movement and elsewhere, where people care for more than just themselves. I hope you all join me in celebrating the life's works of James Connolly and work towards a united Ireland. Thank you. We don't know what the future is going to bring. The conversation around unity has emerged and it has emerged with great strength and energy. And I can understand obviously that people who are unionist and want to retain the union and think that the union is best for everyone are unwilling so far in public to join in the conversation and I would ask them to, I would ask all of us to participate in the conversation because partition hasn't worked on the island for the benefit of all the people. I mean, people aren't going to change their constitutional position unless their constitutional position is going to be improved. And in James Connolly's visitor centre, we would have to say that things have to improve for the people most adversely affected by poverty, by dis economic disadvantage, and also by the lives they've lived under partition. It may take different forms, and it certainly will take a form that respects and values people of a unionist tradition, people who are British, that a way has to be found, and I think people of that view are going to be part and parcel of finding the way forward. <clears throat> but our island is so small, and the, and the world, in other respects, doesn't see the divisions that, 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 that we've seen. Um, and, and certainly, you know, going back historically, and then obviously when we talk about the border, we talk about partition. And we're coming up to the anniversary of that um, and the harm that that's done um, because it's, it, it really has driven a wedge, although there was, there was always a sense in, in, in which um, our identities um, clashed in, in, in some ways historically. That's, that's a reality and it's, it's also true in many other cultures and many other countries. Um, but certainly partition uh, did not help. Uh, and the, the political upheaval and the fallout from that we're still living with. I certainly feel it has hindered working class politics, particularly on the Protestant side, um, developing and becoming more mature so that we address um, issues that are of real concern um, about the quality of schooling, our health system, uh, the availability to, 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 to move in society um, socially. Uh, all of those things, uh, I think, have, uh, f from a working class Protestant point of view, have, have, 
have suffered. Um, and I think we've got to find a way, we've got to find a narrative. Um, and we've, we've got to develop within ourselves, and I also think collectively, the ability to discuss these things um, without resorting to violence. I, I would also want to say, and uh, you know, I'm not trying to um, convince anyone else, I'm just saying for, for, for me personally, um, if, if partition, if the border was removed at some stage in the future, um, I, I, I personally wouldn't have a problem with that, um, whether it's a United Ireland or being part of the United Kingdom. I don't really mind um, as long as it's it's the will of the majority and we've got there in a peaceful way um, and that, that people can coexist together and live peacefully um, and treat each other respectfully. So there are a lot of questions at the moment around the possibility of this statelet to function into the future. And it seems likely uh, from opinion polls that we will see some sort of uh, vote coming in the next decade or the next decades around United Ireland. As we come to that vote, the arguments for United Ireland are compelling. The fact that we might actually have real control over our destinies, the fact that we might have an end to the sectarianism which seems to be inevitably embedded in the way this statelet has set up. That seems no matter uh, what the achievements of the Good Friday Agreement, no matter what the progress of recent decades, the sectarianism of this statelet that seems uh, unable to be removed from the politics of the everyday, whether that's around issues on flags, cultural emblems, language rights and, and even around issues of, uh, that, are, uh, that, that are actually central to British politics. After all, one of the problems we see in this statelet is that people here don't have access to the same rights as people in Britain. That actually unionism results in a situation where the North is anomalous, where it doesn't have the rights that British people expect, even though unionists insist on uh, themselves being part of the British project. So this paradox, this tension, this contradiction at the heart of northern politics, which seems copper fast and within partition, is something which has brought to bear again the questions that Connolly asked around the carnival of reaction, the questions that were being asked at the foundation of this stateless and that were answered with brutality and that were an answered with, um, with repression. We are, we are seeing the emergence again of a period of deep uncertainty for the six counties and I think it's going to be a very fruitful one actually. We shouldn't be looking at this as, as some in the Irish government seem to look at it as, as something that's unnerving or worrying or which they need to be alarmist about. We should be thinking about the fluidity of the, moment, of the present moment politically as an opportunity to explore unsettled questions to answer those questions which were asked 100 years ago and answer it with a more egalitarian vision of what Ireland can be. Um, I suppose we've seen in recent years, you know, great social transformations, north and south, happening differently but affecting each other. And you can see those things coming together across the island. And in a way, that gives out the promise of the hope of the end of partition um, and creating a new context for Ireland. I think also um, the way all of those debates about civic rights, women's rights, children's rights, language rights, all of that debate across the island shows us how we can also have a debate about the future of Ireland, a unified Ireland, um, but with many differences and diversity within it. It is important that all of us who are living through these times do the most that we can do in our moment. We cannot hand this forward as a problem to future generations. We need to do our utmost now. It's been a strange time for all of us, but we in RC Conula have adapted to these challenging times 
And while we haven't been able to bring you to the James Conley Visitor Centre, we have been able to bring James Conley to you through our range of virtual events and discussions. We'd like to take this opportunity to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from everyone in the RC Conula and Falcha First Year team. And we look forward to welcoming you back to the centre when it's safe to do so. <laughs> <laughs>